Hello and welcome. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you to Atlantic Council front page or hashtag AC front page, our premier live ideas platform for global leaders. We've had heads of state, heads of government, uh, sitting uh, cabinet level officials, former cabinet level officials, international organization leaders, uh, and, uh, and sometimes they also are new authors of this wonderful book that I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. We're honored today to host Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, Board Director of the Atlantic Council, Fouad and Michelle Ajami, uh, Senior Fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, and the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. General McMaster show, joins us today for a discussion of U.S. grand strategy with a particular emphasis on U.S. foreign policy regarding China and the Middle East. Uh, there are few who bring a more strategic mindset to these issues. As a historian, as a retired officer with 34 years of experience in the U.S. Army, and as one of uh, our nation's most senior policymakers. In his new book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World, uh, General McMaster lays out what he sees as a new vision for a better U.S. national security policy. He advises the use of strategic empathy uh, to better know and understand our adversaries, and using that perspective to formulate consistent strategies rather than episodic or short-term engagement to solve uh, long-term problems. Uh, General McMaster has cited uh, General Brent Scowcroft, uh, one of the great examples of uh, strategic thinking and character in our foreign policy leadership as an inspiration and model for his tenure at the National Security Council. Uh, as many of you uh, who are listening today know, General Scowcroft was uh, one of the architects, one of the great leaders of the Atlantic Council. He passed away at age 95 uh, this August. Uh, he was a mentor to me along with many others uh, in the world. Uh, he actually focused on being a mentor and didn't care about taking the credit for it, a role model for so many. Uh, both of the co-hosts for, to for today's event the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, and the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative bear his name because they honor his legacy and, uh, and strive to carry on his work. By that, we mean work that would have an ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of strategy and security, would embed in everything we do, partnership and work closely together with our allies and partners, uh, at the same time, he had a remarkable dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders, and he wore um, decency as comfortably uh, as many of us wear, uh, wear our shirts. Uh, so um, thank you again, General McMaster, for joining us today uh, for what promises to be an insightful and enlightening conversation. We're at the cusp of a new administration, but in the way you write, you're really writing uh, uh, about issues that uh, cross over administrations and over eras. Um, uh, we're delighted to have with us today as moderator, Vivian Salama, national security correspondent for CNN. Vivian is a veteran of foreign policy and national security reporting uh, with uh, experience in Washington as well as around the world. Iraq, Egypt, Pakistan, Israel, Palestinian territories, United Arab Emirates, and I'm sure other places as well. Uh, like all of you in our audience, I'm eager to hear General McMaster's insights, but also by his book. Uh, he writes in his, uh, in his note to readers in the, in, in the front that many were asking him to write a tell-all uh, uh, that would have been more lucrative uh, but wouldn't be as lasting. This may, this may not be a tell-all from a personal anecdote standpoint from his time in the White House, but is a, it is a learn-a-lot book and carry it with you. Uh, and, and I recommend that you all buy it and you all read it. Uh, at this point, it's my honor to turn the program over to Vivian. 
Thanks so much, Fred. And of course, I have my copy too. So we're going to be talking a lot about it. Um, I'm really honored to be back at the Atlantic Council. And of course, with uh, General McMaster, who I covered uh, when he was National Security Advisor to President Trump. And so it's great to kind of uh, be able to continue that relationship on the outside. Um, a few housekeeping notes, uh, for, as Fred mentioned, we've got a hashtag for today's event, folks. It's hashtag AC front page. So I definitely encourage you all to get out there on social media. Um, share what we're talking about today. Uh, and also, you know, obviously, this is never ideal right now, what we're doing, this virtual uh, this virtual conversation. We'd love to see your faces, but we still want it to be as interactive as possible. So you're going to see the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please send questions throughout. Uh, we have uh, folks at the Atlantic Council who are going to be sending me some of your questions. We're going to try to cover as many of them as possible. But I'm going to uh, quit uh, the introductions and get dive right in with General McMaster. It's so great. Congrats on the book. It's fascinating. A lot of really substantive subjects that are so important. I see over my shoulder right now that Tony Blinken, the incoming uh, nominee for Secretary of State, is talking. So obviously a lot to talk about with the transition and your advice to the Biden team. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the book itself, General McMaster. Um, specifically, you talk about uh, strategic narcissism versus uh, strategic empathy. And so I wanted to, you to flesh out those two concepts for folks that are wonky foreign policy uh, people like myself. Um, you know, what, is, uh, what has been the U.S. grand strategy in recent years and how do you see that moving forward now that we are on the cusp of a new administration? Well, Vivian, thanks. What, what a privilege it is to be here with you and Fred and, and the Atlantic Council. I'm, you know, it's Thanksgiving week, so I'm thankful for this opportunity and I'm thankful for the great work that the Atlantic Council has done, especially in the midst of this pandemic. You know, I, I, it's the go-to site for me. I, I'm, I'm reading, consuming your products and learning uh, as I do all, all the time uh, from the Atlantic Council's work. Ben, Vivian, just great, great to see you as, as well. Yeah, I really, what, what I write about in, in the book is our tendency to define the world mainly in relation to us. And to assume that what we do or what we choose not to do is going to be decisive to accomplishing a favorable outcome. And I attribute this mainly to our the loss of kind of our competitive edge uh, at, at the end of the Cold War, a period uh, that it was it, that was understandable to be optimistic, right? We had, we had won the Cold War, the Soviet Union collapsed, and then of course we had uh, the, the lopsided victory over the fourth largest army in the, in the world in the 1991 Gulf War. And so there was reason to be optimistic, but we were over optimistic about this new world order that would emerge. And I think we bought into, many people did at least, you know, into, into three overlapping assumptions about the post-Cold War period. First of all, that an arc of history had guaranteed the primacy of our free and open societies over closed authoritarian systems. And I think, secondly, that the great power competition was a, was a relic of the past. And third, that our, our military prowess, our technological military prowess, uh, would guarantee our security going way into the future. And if any foe had the temerity of challenging us, that that fight would be fast, cheap, efficient, you know, at standoff range and so forth. And and Vivian, I argue in the book that this was a setup, right? It was a setup for being disappointed, disappointed by strategic shocks uh, and surprises uh, in the 2000s. The, the, of course, foremost among them, uh, the horrible mass murder attacks against our country on September 11th, 2001, the most devastating terrorist attack in history when you know a brutal and determined enemy used box cutters and airplanes to bypass our, our, our military prowess. And then we had the unanticipated length and difficulty of the wars in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And you know we often debate, okay, should we have invaded Iraq in 2003? I think we ought to debate you know, who thought it was gonna be easy and, and why did they think it would be easy? And then we had the financial crisis in 2008. And I think as the Obama administration came in, the emotional impetus behind our foreign policy shifted from over-optimism to pessimism. And whereas I think it's a fair criticism of the Bush administration to say that, that some leaders within that administration underappreciated the, the, the risk and cost of action, the invasion of Iraq, that in the Obama administration, others underestimated the, the, the risks associated with inaction and disengagement. And the examples I think there are the, the complete withdrawal from Iraq in December of 2001 and how that helped set conditions for the rise of ISIS. But how do you or, achieve middle ground? Yeah. There? I mean, how do you go in to a country and try to promote some democratic ideals that the U.S. might adhere to or anything else while also not shoving it down their 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 throats, so to speak. I mean, this is this is it's a balancing act. How do you do that? 
Well, I think it's with this idea of strategic empathy as the first step, right? So, so what I'm describing is strategic narcissism, right? The tendency to define the world only in relation to us. Of course, that's self-referential, but what it really ignores is the degree to which the other, especially adversaries, enemies, and rivals, have uh, uh, over the uh, over the future, right? How they have authorship over the future as well. And so, I think the most important step is to view the complex challenges we're facing from the perspective of the other. And then to make explicit assumptions about the degree to which we, uh, the, the United States, and like-minded partners uh, can, can can exert influence o- over over the future. I, I also recommend that we, you know, that we we frame these problems more competently by by applying design thinking, by you know, by by trying to understand these these challenges on their own terms and paying particular attention to the ideology, the emotions, and aspirations that drive and constrain the other. Uh, but then also then to view these challenges through the lens of our vital interests, because Amer- Americans these days, Vivian, as, as you know, all too well, are very skeptical uh, ab- about even an active foreign policy, let alone military commitments abroad. And so we have to be able to explain this. So what? Why Why do Americans care, care about this? What is at stake for them in terms of our security, our prosperity our, our, and our influence in the world? How is this going to affect future generations of, of, of Americans and, and citizens across the free world? And so I think then then making assumptions, right? Assumptions again about this degree of agency that we have, and and crafting objectives. I think so often, Vivian, we've engaged in in sustained efforts abroad, diplomatic and military efforts, without a clear idea of what we hope to achieve. And, and mm-hmm. of course, when this happens in war, not only is is that ineffective, but it may also be unethical, right? Because we we don't meet St. Thomas Aquinas's test. Right, of of having that just end in, in mind. So the, the book is is a criticism really of, of our approach to, to these challenges that we face. And it's an argument you know, for strategic empathy and a higher degree of strategic competence. So um, you, you mentioned something about adversaries right now and you know, throw back to your time at the White House where you wrote the National Security Strategy and there was a very interesting uh, balancing act between um, speak to folks at the White House right now who are coming to grips with the fact that we're, we're a transition is now upon us. And they talk about how much has changed in the last four years since uh, Biden was last at the White House. And especially when it comes to China, but also with Russia, how do you engage without totally embracing them? How do you treat them as adversaries and keep them in check versus also trying to um, you know work with them? Well, Vivian, I, I think I, I think that the, the real answer to that is is competition, right? To recognize, you know, that, that Russia and China aren't waiting around to cooperate with us, you know, or for us to lead them in a way that's consistent with with what we think is in our interest or the interests of the of the free world. And so, how do we compete? I think we compete in a transparent manner. You know, I, I think the the corollary, uh, the the China corollary to the assumptions that I discussed earlier was that China having been welcomed into the international order would play by the rules and as it prospered would liberalize its economy and liberalize its form of governance. Okay, now we know the opposite is the case. And you know, I, I had the privilege of convening the principles committee of the National Security Council quite early, I think soon after my arrival, weeks after my arrival, to frame a, a China policy, a new China policy. And I brought with me policies of previous administrations into that meeting and I read a passage uh, a couple of passages from these previous uh, from these previous policies, and just made the observation that we were about to affect, I think, the most significant shift in U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. I think it's a shift that was long overdue. From and I know these labels are only of limited utility, but from cooperation and engagement with the Chinese Communist Party to competition. And and I believe Vivian, you know, competition doesn't need to lead to confrontation. In fact, I think cooperation and engagement and not competing effectively with the, the aggressive policies of the Chinese Communist Party actually had us on a path to confrontation, maybe in places like the South China Sea, where China you know, is, is in the midst of trying to complete the largest land grab, so to speak, in, in history. So if you were meeting with these landing teams now that we're going to the that are going to the NSC in the next coming days, what would you tell them specifically with regard to China, where to begin on a practical level? Well, I think the the, fir- the first piece of advice I would say is like four words: don't fall for it. And and it is what I think are certain to be false promises by the Chinese Communist Party to have us shift back, you know, to this general approach of cooperation uh, and engagement. Yeah. And and I think the false promises will largely be in two areas. You know, the first of these 
uh, will be in the area of, of environment and climate change and, and that set of interconnected global challenges that we face. And the second will probably be in connection with North Korea's nuclear program. The problem with that is Xi Jinping can pledge all he wants, you know, and say the right things about, about environment and climate, you know, carbon neutral by 2060. But, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is building and financing globally about 70 coal-fired plants a year, right? And, and, uh, and then, of course, they'll make, they'll, they'll make pledges on North Korea. But whereas we have a North Korea strategy, China has a U.S. strategy. And that U.S. strategy is to use the issues in the, in the region, and in, in this case, the, the, the nuclear and missile program of North Korea, as a, as a wedge to drive us away from our allies and to, and to drive the, the United States out of, of, of Northeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific broadly. So it can establish really what it wants and what Xi Jinping has said it is established kind of an exclusionary area of primacy across the Indo-Pacific. And, and if China succeeds, it's not only bad for us, but it's, it's, it's really bad for the countries in the region. And, you know, Vivian, I mean, I, I hear oftentimes these days, you know, hey, don't don't force us to choose. We hear this from some of our allies and partners. Don't force us to choose between Beijing and Washington. I think the response of the new Biden administration ought to be, hey, we're not asking you to do that. But we are asking you to choose between sovereignty and servitude. Right. And and we're on the side of, of your sovereignty. And that's what this vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific is all about. And I hope that the Biden administration will see this as a key element uh, of continuity uh, as they put together their foreign policy. So you mentioned nuclear, and I know, uh, you know, certainly at the UN, uh, they've been lighting fires trying to get um, countries around the world to take notice that nuclear armed countries now are are going toward more tense relations. And it's not just we're talking about China and Russia and North Korea, even India and Pakistan. You know, there's 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 a buildup for sure. Um, again, just if you if you were talking to the Biden administration, I mean, wh what can we do here? And we know even in the in recent days, the Trump administration has been trying certainly to get um, a new deal with the Russians because there's a deadline approaching, but even to get China to the table and things like that. How realistic is that? And where do you see this going? What can they do? Yeah, well, I, I think this is immensely important, obviously. I mean, we, we don't want to think about it, right? Because it's unimaginable, the, the use again of the most destructive weapons on earth. But we face this, we face uh, really, uh, I think, the dangers associated with uh, with nuclear buildups that could be destabilizing. This is Russia and the, this new range of, of weapons, you know, that Putin was announcing. Remember the speech that he gave when he showed essentially, you know, nuclear missiles descending on, I think it was like Mar-a-Lago, Florida was, like, was a target of it. I mean, this is a national speech that, that he gave. He's developing these, you know, so-called tactical nuclear weapons or low yield nuclear weapons under this theory of, of escalation domination, right? Or escalate to de-escalate. This is very destabilizing, destabilizing in a way that I think the SS-20 missiles were destabilizing uh, in Europe uh, dur during the Cold War. And of course, China is building up its nuclear capabilities and and, and hasn't been a party to, to arms control uh, negotiations uh, and, and because as you know, there's, these were largely bilateral agreements with, with Russia. So, so arms control itself, I think, should be an area of emphasis. But what we have to remember is an arms control agreement is not an end in and of itself, right? We, we need an agreement that actually improves our security through, through confidence building measures, through reductions in arsenals and, and so forth. But the bigger problem that you're alluding to, uh, Vivian, I think is, is proliferation, you know, and, you know, hey, hey if, if North Korea gets a nuclear weapon, like who doesn't, right? I mean, this is the only... Uh, this is the only hereditary communist dictatorship in the world. Uh, it's a country that has never met a weapon it didn't try to sell to somebody, including its nuclear weapons program to, to Syria until the Israeli Defense Force bombed it in, in 2007. And then if, if North Korea gets a weapon, there's going to be a conversation in, in other countries about do they need a, a nuclear weapon as well. I think South Asia is an area that is increasingly dangerous. You know, they're Tensions between you know between nuclear armed India and Pakistan aren't aren't going away, and then of course you have the Iran problem. I mean, if Iran gets a threshold nuclear capability, I think there are some Arab states who might try to buy a bomb from Pakistan, for example. And then I mean, just think about the the the, the, the complexity associated uh, with with a world in which so many uh, countries have uh, have have nuclear weapons, and and some of these countries are, are you know are run by leaders who have an ideological bent uh, that, that could lead them to justify the use of these most destructive weapons on earth. And as we know, you know, we know that Pakistan um, came pretty close to that uh, several years ago. 
uh, and and certainly that a nuclear dynamic in the Middle East would be would be extremely dangerous. With the buildup of nuclear tensions, like we're talking about, with uh, tensions in the Middle East still sort of on edge, Afghanistan, all these places that we're we're going to get to Iraq and Afghanistan in a moment, but. Your former boss, President Trump, has always touted um, America first, but he has also tried to work with allies. He, he's, he's been received in different ways uh, for various reasons. He's put place tariffs on a lot of allies for in the name of new, new national security, and he's done other things that have just rubbed a lot of our traditional allies the wrong way, especially in Europe. And so what can the Biden administration do moving forward to build coalitions and sort of renew um, faith that America is part of the team. Right. Well, I, I would say first, recognize that there has been a high degree of international cooperation, you know, below the level of you know the president's offensive tweets, you know, about allies or or his skeptical statements about them getting more out of it than, than we do, uh, or the capricious decisions, for example, uh, you know, to withdraw troops from places without consultation with allies. I mean, there have been a lot of issues, obviously. But really below that, there's been a lot, a lot of, of international cooperation. I would say, especially on the aggressive actions of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. You know, Japan has really done a great job in taking the lead on, uh, for example, on World Trade Organization actions associated with unfair Chinese trade and economic practices. We had you know, really unprecedented law enforcement cooperation on China's sustained campaign of cyber espionage. Uh, you know, the quad format uh, across the you know, Pacific, this is this is India, uh, Australia, Japan, and the United States is really invigorated. We ought to maybe send a thank you note to Xi Jinping for that because of his massive attacks on, on Australia, the bludgeoning of Indian soldiers to death on the Himalayan frontier so has sort of galvanized that, that format. The European allies are, are more much more cognizant now in a post-COVID period of the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. I think the banning of Huawei is going to happen. Uh, you know, our partners in Africa are 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 are, are also uh, now you know deeply concerned about about China's economic aggression there and the debt trap set for countries. So I think this is a positive time to come in and to reinvigorate multinational efforts to overcome the challenges we're facing. I'm using China as as one example, but I think what we have to do is is recognize, hey, alliances and and any any multinational cooperation has to be for a purpose, right? And I think what we've learned from, you know, the World Trade Organization and how it was subverted, as well as other international organizations like the Human Rights Council or, or UNESCO for that matter, or the International Civil Aviation Organization, you know, that th these are competitive spaces in them of themselves. There is no prize for membership. We have to compete within those organizations to, to ensure that China and other countries that are hostile to the free world's interests don't turn those organizations against their purpose, right? So, so I, I hope that that the, the, our alliances will be reinvigorated, but reinvigorated with a clear purpose, clear purposes in mind. You think more can be done as uh, an international community, and certainly with the U.S. in the lead um, to rally in support of Hong Kong and Taiwan. You talk a lot about Taiwan in your book. Uh, you know, how how can we how can we approach that moving forward? Well, I, I do, and and I think that there are there are there are probably some counterintuitive actions we can take internationally. You know, I, I think China, you know, China is effective. And what I read about in battlegrounds is they have the strategy broadly of co-option, coercion, and concealment. Right? Co-opt us with you know the lure of, of profits, uh, lure of access to their market, lure of, uh, of of Chinese loans, for for example. And then once you're in, then they coerce you to to adhere to their their worldview. I mean. What you have to do is look at the NBA, you know, for as an example. But this this is the effect that they have on on countries as well as as well as companies. And I think there ought to be some kind of an international agreement where like minded countries agree that they will only invest in in China. They will only allow Chinese investment in, in our in our countries if those investments, kind of from the standpoint of maybe an economic Hippocratic oath, do no harm that we are not helping the Chinese Communist Party stifle human freedom internally and perfect this technologically enabled Orwellian surveillance police state. How's that for a lot of adjectives? But then also that we're not enabling uh, them uh, to, to create these servile relationships uh, and, to, and to gain this, you know, this, this position of, of, of primacy that, that is exclusionary and, and, uh, and that compromises the sovereignty of, of countries. Uh, and that we ought to also agree that we're not investing, you know, in, in Chinese businesses and, and industries that gives them a differential advantage 
a differential advantage in the emerging data-driven global economy where their statist economic model, their mercantilist model uses our free market system against us. And certainly we shouldn't be investing in the People's Liberation Army's effort to overmatch our, our militaries. So I think an international agreement about that, what someone said kind of the, the T10 uh, of, of 10 democratically you know, governed uh, countries that have advanced technological and scientific programs. I think that's a really good initiative. But I think there are other initiatives we could take as well. What if, for example, Vivian, we said, okay, any Chinese national employed by our companies who comes under the coercive power of the Chinese Communist Party, hey, you and your family get a visa, right? So where some people think reflexively, oh, gosh, reduce you know, chi- you know, Chinese uh, immigration to the United States, because, you know, they're, they're engaged in a sustained campaign of industrial espionage. OK, let the FBI worry about that. But I think there could be a big brain drain associated with that. Vivian, we ought to be confident for, for many reasons. But one of them is, you know, people really want to come to our country. There aren't too many people trying to immigrate into China for obvious reasons. So I think that we ought to use those advantages to, to our benefit. We ought to be cognizant of and, and build on our competitive advantages in this competition. Um, I have 7,000 follow-up questions. Hopefully um, some folks touch upon on the Q- in the Q&A, but I do, while we still have a little bit of time left before Q&A, I want to touch upon uh, the situation in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, you've been out in the media talking about your opinion about uh, the proposed uh, drawdown by January 15th. And so um, I don't want to necessarily uh, have you repeat your stance on it, but I do want to ask you sort of where this leaves us come January 20th in terms of, you know, do we have alternatives so that we don't create a vacuum in these two countries, which happen to be near and dear to both of our hearts? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you basically stop history from repeating itself, essentially, where we were in the Obama administration withdrawing in 2011, and then having to go back in 2014 to a place like Iraq? Well, you know, Vivian, I think that's exactly, we have to be capable of at least learning from our most recent history, right? And, and I, I think that, you know, the, the Trump administration's foreign policies have fallen short, mainly in areas where they doubled down on the deficiencies of the Obama administration's policies, right? And this is in, this is in Afghanistan in, in, in particular. And I know why Americans are frustrated. And I know that there is a call to end the endless wars, you know, across the political spectrum. But Vivian, I, I think what's happened is this is a failure of leadership across multiple administrations. I don't think President Trump did. I don't think President Obama did. Really make it make it a big effort in trying to explain to the American people what they need to know to sustain an effort over time. And that is, hey, first of all, and we talked about this initially at the, at the beginning, what is at stake? So what? Why, why, do you, why do we care in, in Dayton, Ohio, or Peoria, Illinois, or wherever about, about Afghanistan? And I think we can make that case. We can say, hey, we we are prioritizing our security here. We're going to prevent jihadist terrorists uh, from from ever again gaining a safe haven and support base that they can use to commit attacks on on the scale of 9/11. But the second question they need to 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 have an answer to is, hey, what is the strategy? What is the strategy that will deliver that that desired outcome at a cost that is acceptable? And in Afghanistan. You know, we were down to a very small, we are down to a very small number of troops. And the Afghans are bearing the brunt of the fight. I mean, you know, we have had uh, 10 c- courageous uh, soldiers give their lives uh, this year uh, for us in, in Afghanistan. But in that same period, about 30 Afghan soldiers and policemen give their lives a day, you know, to, ensuring that the Taliban is, is never able to reimpose the kind of brutal rule that they lived under uh, from 96 to 2001. And then again, give safe haven and support bases to 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 uh to terrorist organizations vivian what this is i think this is probably the most dramatic example of strategic narcissism i can think of because in, in afghanistan we've actually conjured up the enemy we would prefer rather than the actual enemy we're engaged with and this is the taliban and and i and i think that we the american people need an honest uh description of this enemy rather than this fantasy that we've we've developed uh and and, and i think americans will support a sustained commitment at a sustainable level, if they understand what's at stake and hey, what the strategy is, I think. I think oddly, President Trump did that. I think in in, in August or September of 2017, uh, but then but then he he backed off of it. I think in large measure because there is this move toward retrenchment and disengagement that really cuts across both political parties. So you're not a fan of talking to the Taliban necessarily directly in terms no. of the presidential hey, level. 
Yeah, yeah. It, Vivian, if it had been up to me, I would have closed the, the Taliban political office in Doha. You know, what, they're living in you know, five star hotels. You know, I mean, these are th these people. Uh, you know, do they really represent the Taliban? I, I'm not 100 percent convinced of that anyway. Uh, do, do they you know, are they are, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think this helped them maintain a degree of cohesion when I think it, when fighting a group like this, you want to fragment them. And of course, you want to keep the door open right to to some kind of a diplomatic settlement. But but really, that diplomatic settlement, I, I think, ought, ought to result from the key Taliban leaders concluding, hey, they can't accomplish their objectives through the use of force. The way we went about this negotiation and the concessions that we made bold and actually really increased their will uh, to continue their violent campaign uh, against the Afghan people. I mean, during the negotiations, right? I mean, right after we signed the agreement, they attacked a maternity hospital and they killed infants and 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 expectant mothers. You know, they they they've executed you know attacks on the Afghan on the the uh, American University uh, of, of of Afghanistan and, and gunned down young people who were who were studying to to help strengthen their their country. I I think these are some of the most important people on earth. We forced the Afghan government to release five thousand prisoners. Uh, and then weaken the Afghan government kind of on our way out. I mean, and so I, I, I just think it was it was not only an unwise policy, but 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 I, I think it's it's really unethical what we've done. Um, and, and you know, as you alluded to, I mean, I think we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back because you know we we have not really played this out in our minds. And uh, and when we see the humanitarian catastrophe, but we also see jihadist terrorist organizations in this ecosystem, this terrorist ecosystem that exists on the Afghan-Pakistan border, we see them emboldened. We see them enriched by the narcotics trade and the profits associated with it. I mean, we're going to have to go back, just at, just as like we did, had to go back in 2014 uh, after ISIS took over territory the size of Britain. It's a sad cycle. Um, I have eaten up a little bit of the Q&A time. I apologize. Um, I want to go to uh, uh, Kirsten Fontenrose uh, at the Atlantic Council. She's director for the Scowcroft Middle East Security Initiative, also a former NSC official. Kirsten, it's good to see you. Uh, I, I give you the floor. Ask your question, please. Thanks so much, Vivian. And like you said, a thousand burning questions, but HR, I'll try to, to contain it to one. There's this misconception in some circles that the idea of strategic empathy will necessarily lead policymakers to these warmer, fuzzier approaches to adversaries. But in my experience working with you, that greater depth of understanding of adversaries can sometimes lead to practical insights that may actually toughen the U.S. position. So if you were sitting down with the Biden team to draft a new national security strategy, how would you recommend amending or reframing U.S. objectives in light of lessons you're drawing from the strategic empathy approach? You know, in what areas should we be turning the ship? Yeah. Well, hey, Kirsten, thanks. And hey, thanks for your extraordinary service on the NSC staff. It was such an honor to serve with you and you made so many tremendous contributions. Great to see you at the Atlantic Council and great to be with you today, too. Hey, I, I think that you begin with strategic empathy, not to not to be kind of fuzzy. I mean, I, you know, I am kind of a huggy person, you know, but I'm, you know, but but I, I, I'm a staunch advocate for our interests, and, and and I recognize that we need to, to need to compete. But you know, I, I think that this applies to Iran in particular, and I would just encourage the Biden administration to really take a hard look at the ideology, the emotions, aspirations that drive the Iranian regime, and not the fake Iranian regime. You know, not the shop window, you know, of, of, of Zarif and Rouhani, but the real Iranian regime of uh, of of the Supreme Leader, uh, the Guardian Council, and, and the RGC. And I think once you look at at the the the, the, the long history now, you know, four decade long history of of our relations with Iran since the revolution in 1979, you really see the failure of multiple approaches toward Iran that were based on the idea that conciliation with Iran would lead to a change in the in the nature of that government such that it would cease its permanent hostility to the great Satan, you know, us, the little Satan, Israel, uh, the Arab monarchies. And I would just say like the, you know, the Europe and, and the West, because we have to remember that, that uh, Iran is, is the greatest uh, sponsor of, of terrorist organizations globally as well. And and has executed, you know, uh, attacks in, in Europe and Argentina and Panama, you know, globally. So, so, uh, so I, I think that I would. That's what I would encourage because I, I really fear that that, that we're going to resurrect this idea uh, that if we just go back to 2016, if we get the Iran nuclear deal back in place, well, I, I would just say look at what Iran did 
after the Iran nuclear deal. The money that flowed into Iran with payoffs and, 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 and money that flowed in as a result of the alleviation of sanctions, it got applied uh, to, to that proxy war and intensified uh, Iran's efforts across the region, efforts that I think are, are designed uh, you know, to keep the Arab world perpetually weak and by keeping it enmeshed in conflict uh, and efforts that are designed to place a proxy army on the border of Israel and threaten Israel with destruction. So, I, I mean, I, that would be my number one application of strategic empathy in terms of advice uh, to a Biden administration that's looking in particular at, at a Middle East policy. Uh, I, I mean, there, there are a lot of questions about the JCPOA and the inevitability that uh, Biden will in some form pursue uh, talks with Iran. And so in that likelihood, given that likelihood, what is your advice both to them in terms of keeping Iran in check, but also allies in the region who in the last couple of months have been sort of teaming up with Israel as a, you know, a way to maybe couch um, that possible adversary, you know, sp adversarial spike in the region again. So how, how does that all play out? Well, I, I think in part, I mean, first of all, I think the Abraham Accords is a great achievement. I think, you know, the Trump administration should get credit for that. I mean, I think it really goes to back to the, you know, President Trump's visit to Riyadh. When people were saying, what the heck is Donald Trump doing going to Riyadh? You know, and then and the speech that that he gave uh with with uh King Solomon's speech together. I mean, I think that was you know, that was a time of great promise. Of course, you know, whenever you get your hopes up in connection with the Middle East, they get dashed to a certain extent as they did. Uh, with uh, the way that, uh, that that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman consolidated power, uh, the murder of, of Jamal Khashoggi, a U.S. you know a U.S. resident and a journalist. I mean, so you know, whenever you get your hopes up, Middle East, they tend to get dashed. But I think this was a significant development over time of a recognition by Arab states that their security interests align with those uh, of Israel, and 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 the reason they do is because of Iran's again forty four decade long proxy war. You know, against against these Arab monarchies and and against Israel and, and against and against us and and so I I think that this is something that could be built on and, and with good effect not only be for for the regional security dynamic of of deterring Iran but also removing the ideological support for jihadist terrorist organizations because it's the specter of Iranian backed militias and the threat that they pose to beleaguered Sunni communities that allow Sunni communities at times to view jihadist terrorists, Salafi jihadist groups, these takfirin groups uh, as patrons and, and protectors, right? And, and kind of keep them on, on life support. So I think when you look at the broad region, what, what the strategy you want to put together is you want to try to, to, to put a break on these centripetal forces associated with the sectarian civil war that is causing so much human suffering, a humanitarian catastrophe, and, and also uh, increasing political risk uh, to, to countries in, in the region. So I think I would just say build, build on that uh, and, and, uh, and, and recognize that there are some aspects of, of a Trump administration policy that are worth following up on. The other thing, Vivian, I would just say broadly is I think I, I would ask you know any new administration coming in, uh, the Biden administration maybe in particular because of the, its approach to the region previously, uh, but this was also the Trump administration approach toward the end. <laughs> Do not view the Middle East mainly as a mess to be avoided, because just when you think it can't get worse in the Middle East, it actually it actually can. And so this is not a call for vast numbers of troops in the region or for the U.S. taking on the burden of all the region's problems but also recognizing that our disengagement creates hedging behavior that makes the situation worse. It was the unenforced red line in Syria, 2013 and 2014, that led to Russian intervention in, in the Syrian civil war. And then of course led to now, what are these serial episodes of mass homicide in that war, such that half the Syrian population is dead, wounded, or displaced. That placed a burden, as you know, not just on countries in the region, but also on Europe. Uh, and, and, and created a political dynamic in Europe where the refugee crisis interacted with the rise of nativist parties. I mean, it could go on about this, right? Problems in the Middle East <laughs> don't stay in the Middle East. And so it is worth a sustained long-term approach to prevent the hedging behavior uh, that, that blocks the path toward long-term solutions. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in. Thank you for that. I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. We have about four minutes to go. Uh, anonymous question uh, from someone out there. How do we overcome China's long-term strategic view seen in efforts such as the Belt and Road Initiative, given that the U.S. only has four to eight year long strategies and depend on the current administration? 
Hey, well, thanks for that. I mean, that's why I wrote Battlegrounds. I really, I wanted to write it in a way that's nonpartisan, right? These, I mean, I think that we ought to be able to come together around the challenges we're facing and craft, you know, nonpartisan solutions that are sustainable across multiple administrations. Obviously, part of foreign policy has to be flexible, right? You're always going to interact with, you know, with determined adversaries and in complex environments, the unanticipated, you know, like a pandemic, for example. I mean, there are things that are going to happen that you couldn't, you didn't anticipate adequately uh, or think about adequately in the future. But I think an overall approach to our foreign par- policy is, is is really what I, the argument I try to make in the book. I think that the, one of the main danger to that these days is is this idea that hey, after we emerge from these quadruple crises of a pandemic a recession, the social divisions laid bare by George Floyd's murder and the, and the aftermath associated with that and concerns over inequality of opportunity and unequal treatment under the law. And, and now, of course, this vitriolic political <laughs> season, you know, that we're still, I guess, in, uh, you know, I, I, that, that we have to just we have to put you know, foreign policy on the back burner. But hey, I'll tell you, Vivian, we should learn if we learn anything from COVID-19, it ought to be that problems and challenges that develop overseas can only be dealt with at an exorbitant cost after they reach our shores. And I think we, we should learn this from 9-11 as well. So the book is an argument for a sustained and sustainable approach to foreign policy. And, and I hope foreign policy can be a, an arena, an area that brings us back together as Americans, reverse some of this, this partisan uh, polarization that we've seen you know, in, in recent years. Got it. Thank you. Uh, just for one last question, I, I thought we'd go personal because we do get a lot of students um, who attend virtually or in person these events. And so, you know, you have been an author and a, a doctor, you have a doctorate and national security advisor and a decorated military officer. I mean, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, for students out there who want to be you, who want to be just like you, how do you, how do you achieve these things? Like what's the path to a career either as a senior military officer, obviously, but even just uh, as a national security advisor or someone senior in the foreign policy world. Well, hey, hey thanks, Vivian. I, I look back at my career, it was just a great gift. And, and I'll tell you it to me, I mean, the, the ability to serve in our army, the ability to be alongside incredible young men and women, to learn from so many of my colleagues over the years. I mean, I, I really, I think that, that, that service can be immensely rewarding, right? You see, this, you see the hardships of it a lot, but you do, it's hard to grasp sometimes those less tangible rewards of being part of a team uh, that, that is engaged in a mission that's bigger than yourself, right? Being part of a team that takes on the qualities of a family with you know, under shared hardships and, and under the kind of challenges that you face and a team in the military in which the, the young man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you, right? It's so, it, it's an immensely rewarding career field to serve in the military, but outside the military as well. So I would encourage young people Hey, take a crack at service up front, right? And you know, we hear so much these days about like the malign deep state and everything. I think that I think that's nonsense. You can make a big difference, you know, for your government, for your fellow citizens, for humanity. Um, and so, uh, you know, and then the second thing I would just say, Vivian, and and you know, I, I get a chance to interact with amazing young people here, you know, at in, in, uh, at Stanford. A lot of young people want to map out their whole career like from the day of graduation. I would just say, don't worry about it. Do something that's fun and exciting and challenging and that will allow you to make a difference. And so many different opportunities will, will, will open up to you. I mean, I, I thought I was going to be a, <laughs> I was going to be commissioned in aviation. I was commissioned in aviation. I became an armor officer and I was going to get out for five years. I stayed in for, you know, 20, as, as my wife Katie calls it, 29 bonus years, you know, beyond the five years <laughs> in the army. Uh, you know, the, the opportunity to, to go to graduate school and study and read and think about history was probably the best preparation I had for many of my assignments later in my career, especially as that of national security advisor. Um, and, and I just think continuously learning in, in battlegrounds, I, I write about it in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the conclusion of the book, that the greatest strength of our society is an educated populace. For young people in particular, I would say, hey, if anybody's trying to feed you an orthodoxy, don't buy it, right? Read more, read different perspectives, talk to people who have different perspectives, be tolerant. What, what I'm worried about today is, you know, I think that there's a loss of empathy, <laughs> strategic empathy for, you know, for, for uh, in, the, in connection with national security, but it's, it's almost like we've lost the, the, the ability to empathize with one another, right? We're more, we're more connected than ever electronically, but I think we're growing more distant from each other emotionally and psychologically. So I would just say, you know, welcome those who have different viewpoints, have meaningful, respectful discussions, you know, be part of bringing America back together and, and restoring our confidence in, in who we are as, as a people and restore our confidence in, in this great gift of our democracy. 
Gentlemen McMaster, I have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Congrats again on the book. It's fantastic. Thanks to Kirsten and Fred and everyone at the Atlantic Council. A reminder, this was on record, folks. And uh, we appreciate it. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank Happy you, Vivian. Thank you, sir.